And for the adult class, we have our brother Stephen McFarlane delivering his final class on overcoming Jericho, the sin of Achan. And so we'll now call him forward to deliver his words to us. Well, thank you, Brother Jacob, and good morning, brothers and sisters and and those that are connecting in with us. We hope you've had a wonderful weekend. I hope you were able to spend a little bit of time outside yesterday. It's nice when the warm weather hits. A lot of excitement uh, in our house. The kids were outside uh, all day yesterday. So it's great to be able to enjoy the time outside and now to come inside this morning to open up the Word of God and to dig deep into uh, the sin of Achan this morning. This is our final study as we've been working our way through this theme of overcoming Jericho, considering the early chapters of the book of Joshua and what a story it's been. We began with the work of Joshua, this new leader who took over from the work of Moses. We saw this development that took place in the life of Joshua. We looked at the faith of Rahab, a tremendous faith, that this woman had. And we left her with the scarlet line flying from her window. And then we considered the defeat of Jericho, this victory by God in the most unlikely of ways. And yet we know that not all of Jericho was overcome. Just turn back in your Bibles. Let's pull them out and and turn back to Joshua chapter 6. And let's just recall the words we read in verse 18 last week. Joshua 6 and verse 18, it reads, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed, when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now that word trouble here to the end of the verse is the word achor. Perhaps you make a note in your margin here or in Joshua 7 and verse 1 to 1 Chronicles 2. Verse 7, because it's there we read concerning the son of Carmi, Achor, or Achar, the troubler of Israel. So here in this warning from God is this little prophecy of what we'll consider together this morning concerning Achan. We're thrown right into the story of the sin of Achan, aren't we? For in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 7, we read, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for there are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. What's made known to us right away in verse 1, brothers and sisters, isn't yet known to Joshua and the people. And so fresh off the victory at Jericho, we see the next conquest being planned in verse 2. Once again, the same strategy is put forward, is taken up by Joshua to send men to view the city just like they did with Jericho. But notice their words when they return to Joshua. We see this emotion of self-confidence. Let not all the people go up, they said. Remember, Remember last week, brothers and sisters, what the captain of the host of God's army said to Joshua, take all the men of war, Joshua. 
Take everyone, Joshua. Involve and include everyone in this fight against the flesh. And yet we see how the faith in the people begins to subside. And it turns over to overconfidence. There's a quote that speaks to this feeling and how we can combat it. It says, this is a serious shortcoming to human nature. This idea of overconfidence. To forget from one day to the next just how great is the help that we receive from the Lord. And how little we can do by ourselves. The Lord's help is seldom visible. But is nevertheless crucial as we attempt our work. Whatever it may be. Let us learn to attempt nothing without first asking his blessing. And especially that he will show us where we have done wrong so that we may put it right. That's going to become very important here in this story. Now that phrase, to labor, make not all the people to labor in verse 3. It means to become weary, to gasp, to be exhausted. See, coming off that battle at Jericho, they don't want to be exhausted again. Just send a few, Joshua. Ecclesial life can be like this, can't it? We put on a study day, and the next responsibility that follows closely on its heels, and we think, maybe just go easy on this one. Someone else will take on this task. Our spiritual lives can get like this. We're exhausted after a long day's work, We'll get to the readings tomorrow. Too much work to get dressed and ready to go to the meeting today. We'll just dial in. They are but few, the men said, returning from AI. God can work with few, can't he? Gideon teaches us that lesson that we have have read. That we know that God can work with a few from 22,000 down to 300 men. They are but few. They said, returning from Ai. This overconfidence was going to be tested, brothers and sisters. This feeling of overconfidence. And so up go these 3,000 men towards Ai. But quickly, something is wrong. No victory here as they flee before the men of Ai. Now beside verse 4 in our margins, two helpful references. Certainly where Joshua's mind would go shortly. Just make note here, beside verse 4, For they fled before the men of Ai. Leviticus 26, verses 15 through 17. And Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 25. Leviticus 26, verses 15 through 17. And Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 25. Because in both of those references... The children of Israel were told that if they disobeyed the commandments of God, if they broke the covenant, God would make them flee from before their enemies. And that's just what happens here. So they fled from before Ai, and they come down in verse 5 to Shebarim. Now it's very helpful, brothers and sisters, when we study to just look up words that we come across that we don't know. Does anyone have a note for what Shebarim means in their Bible? Well, let's get our pencils out because it means the breaches. It means ruins. And it's only used here in the Hebrew. But the Hebrew root, brothers and sisters, it means to fracture or to break. See, the children of Israel are here in Shebarim, and they are fractured, aren't they? See that phrase in verse 5? The hearts of the people melted. That's the exact language of Joshua 5 and verse 1. When Rahab said that the nations melted at the stories of Israel. Joshua 2, sorry. Now they're the ones that are melting. Complete panic and concern is running through this group of the children of Israel, coming off the victory at Jericho. Yet here was this nomadic group running from a small city. How would they fare overtaking the rest of this land? What had happened? 
What was wrong? It's been said that when trouble disturbs an ecclesia, it's a time of self-inspection. You wonder how often we do this, brothers and sisters. Perhaps enough, perhaps not. When trouble disturbs an ecclesia, perhaps it's pastoral challenges, marital issues, false doctrine that creeps in, the loosening of standards, a young person who's not interested in the things of baptism. It can be a time for self-inspection. And so we see in verse 6, after the people melt and become as water, that Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? You can just imagine the concern here with Joshua. You can read the despair in his words, the confusion, the worry. Just keep a hand here and come back to Numbers 14. Numbers 14, this is right after the ten spies give their report of the land. And look at the words of the people. Numbers 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept, that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, similar language, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? To be on the other side, Jordan, Joshua said. We see that Joshua uses similar language to what followed after the report of the ten faithless spies. Joshua is in despair. Now back in Joshua 7 and verse 7, we can tuck in Exodus 16 and verse 3 in our margins. Because again, the same phrases are picked up here by the children of Israel. Would to God, they say, that we should have died in the land of Egypt. And Joshua here is confused. He's worried. He's struggling, brothers and sisters. And so what does God do? God cuts him off. God interrupts these words and he says in verse 10, get up. Why do you have your face in the ground? Why have you fallen on your face, Joshua? Get up. God is more concerned here, brothers and sisters, in what Joshua is going to do. It wasn't about regret. It was about action. Get up, Joshua. You're needed now to solve this problem. Because we read in verse 11, Israel hath sinned. Now we titled our study, the sin of Achan. That's what it is. That's certainly how we view it, brothers and sisters. But inter in interestingly enough, when we come to the record, we see it includes more than that, don't we? Look back at verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. And there in verse 11, Israel hath sinned. They have transgressed. See, we're being shown, aren't we, brothers and sisters, our collective responsibility as an ecclesia. It's reminding us of the words of 1 Corinthians 12 that when one member suffers, we all suffer. There's a principle here that can't be lost on us, brothers and sisters. We're not saying that when one member sins, we bear that sin. 
But there's a shared responsibility of an ecclesia to where even here with Achan, the sin of the individual is attributed to the group, not in deed, but in responsibility. They had all been warned together back in Joshua chapter 6. They were to be watching over one another, helping ensure obedience to the commands of God. Perhaps Achan's sin could have been prevented. We are a body, brothers and sisters. There is a collective responsibility within our ecclesia. It's something to think about. Perhaps we've heard or perhaps we've said things to the effect of Book Road does it that way. Book Road made that decision. Book Road doesn't care. Brothers and sisters, we are Book Road. This is our ecclesia. That's the point that's being drawn home. We have a shared responsibility to the whole of our ecclesia. If our feeling is one way about Book Road, about whatever ecclesia we belong to, then help to correct it because it's all of us. And so here in verse 11, we see that Israel hath sinned, but God keeps going, pushing and pushing. They sinned. They transgressed. They have taken of the accursed thing. They stole. They dissembled also. They have put it even among their own stuff. Six things, brothers and sisters, to make this very, very clear. Do we get the picture? Six things. Now something needs to be done about it. And so right away in verse 13, we read, Up! Sanctify the people, Joshua, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in Israel. In the midst of thee, O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come, shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by household, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. Up, Joshua. Get up. Get going. There's a need to be active. That's what we're being told. There's a need to be active to remove sin in ourselves and in our ecclesias. And what's the first thing that Joshua is told to do. Sanctify the people. That word sanctify, it means to be pure or to clean. Fix it, God is saying. Clean it, Joshua. Purify the ecclesia. Now that's not an easy thing to do, is it, brothers and sisters? Especially in the days in which we live. It's difficult to do in our day, a time when it's more common to hear, no one can tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me what I should do in my life? And yet Joshua is told to sanctify the people. Fix it, clean it, purify it, Joshua. Separate yourselves, God is saying, and do this in the morning. Interesting that it was in the morning. See, Achan, brothers and sisters, had the opportunity to confess. What a night that must have been. What a night that must have been for Achan. I remember once when I received a speeding ticket. I was still living at home, and I, I came home, and I knew I had to get it over with right away to go and talk to mom and dad. It was late. And I remember being in my room with my brother Mark, and he was pumping me up to walk down the hall to go and face what I had done, to go and tell them what I had done. This was just 15 minutes, and it seemed like an eternity. Imagine a whole night knowing what was coming for Achan. And yet Achan didn't do anything. A helpful verse for our margins here in verse 14 
is Numbers 32, verse 23. Be sure, God says, your sin will find you out. What a verse. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, verse 23. And we see there in verse 13 that it was the Lord God of Israel who was saying this to Joshua, to get up and to sanctify the people. Now, Brother John Martin has this to say on why this title is used here in this context and how, brothers and sisters, it relates to us. He said, thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Now, it wasn't Yahweh of hosts. Why wasn't it? Because God was not going to bring them before judgment to condemn them all. But what he was going to do was to bring them to judgment to answer for the promise made to God. And that's the name of the covenant God, Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Achan, you have to answer for the covenant you made back in Joshua chapter 5. How does this relate to us? We've got to face up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not as Yahweh of armies. He's not out to destroy us. He will bring us before him and say, you were baptized. You gave a solemn allegiance to me, Yahweh, Elohim of Israel. We've all agreed to the BASF, not only in doctrine, but to all the principles that are related to those doctrines. It's the covenant God that we're going to answer to. And he will stand us there and we'll answer to that. All the truth means we will answer to in all its positive and negative aspects. And there will be no excuses. That's the God they've got to face tomorrow. What a restless sleep that must have been for Achan that night. Knowing the God he would face in the morning. A God who keeps his covenants and expects the same from us. And we see how a similar phrase in the life of Joshua, as we noted last week, now appears. For in verse 16, Joshua rose up early. We noted how this was a theme among many faithful in Scripture. But here, brothers and sisters, there's another lesson that we can take away. Joshua certainly was a man of action. We read in Psalm 119, verse 60, that I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. That's the attitude now of Joshua. But brothers and sisters, what we see here is that hard conversations, hard decisions, difficult actions shouldn't be put off. Now that's easy to say. It's hard to implement. But Joshua shows us the example to follow. When we have challenging conversations and decisions to make, move forward. Move forward with the word of God guiding our actions. Get up early. And so Joshua gets to work. And if we have our highlighters out, or your pencils, we see what God is going to work out through the actions of Joshua. We've just highlighted the word on the screen that continues through verses 14 through 18. It's the references to this word, taketh and taken. Because this word means to capture. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because if we look back at Joshua 6 and verse 20, it's the same word that's used of what the children of Israel did to Jericho. They took it. They captured it. And now God is saying to Joshua, we need to continue capturing the effects of Jericho. See, brothers and sisters, this is what has to happen in our lives as well. We need to capture Jericho. We need to capture its effects, its impact that tries to creep into our lives, that tries to make its way into our homes. We need to get rid of it. Take it, Joshua. And so the process begins with all the tribes coming before Joshua. And Judah is taken. And then from Judah, the family of the Zarhites. And from that family, the household of Zabdi is taken. And you can picture the scene here, brothers and sisters. You can imagine the whispers 
running through the nation. You can imagine the tribe of Judah, everyone looking around, was it you? Was it you? And then man by man of the house of Zabdi is brought and Achan is taken. Now just remember the words back in Joshua 1, brothers and sisters, because there's a thread that runs through Joshua showing how clear the instruction was from God in what was to happen in this situation. Joshua 1 verse 18 read, Whosoever he be that doth rebel against my commandments and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. And then the words of Joshua 6 verse 18 that we began with, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. That's the command from God. Lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing. Achan knew, brothers and sisters, what would happen if he went against the laws of God. He was there with the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 5 when they renewed the covenant and kept the Passover. When they had committed their ways to the words of God. And yet Achan is taken from everyone else. And so we read in verse 19. It says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. My son, Joshua says. You can put yourself here in this scene. The tone of voice in Joshua as he appeals to Achan. This phrase, my son, is the Hebrew word ben. This is a son as the builder of a family name. This would have hit Achan for what was he now building for his family. But we notice that Joshua doesn't berate him. He speaks sternly, but calmly. And he asks Achan to make confession unto God. Interesting that Joshua doesn't ask for confession to Israel, but unto God. We also see that Joshua could have said, okay, Achan, you've been chosen, you know the consequences. But instead he offers him the opportunity to not only confess to God, but to speak openly about what he did so that the nation might learn. What we have here is a picture of the judgment. Because in the presence of God, Achan is making confession before Joshua. What a type, brothers and sisters. Give praise to God and tell me, Joshua says, as a type of our Lord, here at a time of judgment. And we read Achan's response. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Now, it's important to remember, brothers and sisters, that Achan wasn't volunteering this information, was he? This was being forced out of him. He could have come forward immediately after he did this. Or last night before all of this took place with the nation. Or when the tribe of Judah was taken. But he waited and waited and waited. And while we can imagine the atmosphere in the camp, Achan remained hardened in his sin, not coming forward as the lot came down, down, down. And now Achan is caught in the entanglement of sin. When I saw, he said, then I coveted, then I took. We read in verse 11 that God viewed Achan as having put this in his own possessions, in his own stuff. It's as if Achan was saying, it's mine. 
it makes us think this morning about what we might be holding on to, like it's our own. When the angels come to get us for judgment, what will our minds be tied to of the things that we consider our own possession? The stuff in the house. We're told in Luke 17, verse 31, to leave it. The stuff in the house, don't go back inside for it. And let's just think about what what happened here with Achan. After he saw it, he coveted and he took it. Achan would have had a moment of feeling satisfied. He would have felt the satisfaction of what he now had in his possession. Then he hid it. Well, that's sin, isn't it? Sin is never worth it, brothers and sisters. It's a fleeting moment, and then you hide it. And that's one of the great tragedies, brothers and sisters, because we see what would have happened if Achan had just shown patience. He would have enjoyed the spoils of Ai. If you just turn over to Joshua 8 and verse 2, It says there, And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey for yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. Achan, if he was patient, would have had spoils. See, brothers and sisters, if we take of the world now, if we lose patience now, We risk our opportunity for the glory that will follow. And so Achan stole a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Now there's something that we're being told here in these items, a clear picture of what Achan was really holding on to, what he thought he had in his possession. In the Hebrew, that word Babylonish is the word sinar. And the other seven occurrences of this word, it's always translated Shinar. Always. This is the only time it's translated Babylonish. Now, why is that interesting? Well, just make a note here in verse 21 for Genesis 10 and verse 10. Genesis 10, brothers and sisters, is the kingdom of Nimrod. We're told here the beginning of his kingdom, that's not God's kingdom, this is man's kingdom, was Babel in the land of Shinar. See, this garment was brought into the camp of Israel. This was done in defiance of the command of God, the thinking of the flesh, of man's kingdom. And there's no place for it in the camp of Israel before the God of heaven and earth. There is a garment, though. There is a garment, a better one, that we should look for. Isaiah 52 and verse 1 is a great verse here for us in verse 21 of our margin. Isaiah 52 and verse 1. It says, awake, awake. Notice it's early in the morning, brothers and sisters. Just like here in Joshua 7. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Isaiah 52 and verse 1, there is a garment that we should wait for. But Achan wanted it now. He couldn't wait, brothers and sisters. He wanted what the world had to offer now. He wanted these things right now. They're mine, he was saying. We're told in Proverbs 28, verse 22, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye. It's the very problem of Achan. In his book titled Joshua, His Life and Times, Brother John Ullman writes that covetousness is one of the greatest destroyers of men. Not only because it is evil in itself, but because it fills the mind with obsessive lust to the exclusion of divine wisdom. Far too often we think we can please ourselves that we can cut corners in the service of God. We attempt to outmaneuver God, which cannot be done. That's what we see from Achan. I saw, I coveted, I hid. No, he thought he hid. 
And it makes us ask the question, brothers and sisters, of whether we are sometimes as absent-minded as Achan, thinking we too can hide things from our Heavenly Father. Now, we can't miss the obvious connections here to so many passages in Scripture. Warnings, really, for the process that Achan fell victim to. Now, we've put two Bible boxes on the screen just to demonstrate this process, to see clearly how easy it is to fall victim to the very same thing that Achan did. We see the demonstration of all that is in the world, The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And just like Eve in the garden with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Achan walked down this very same path. And we see from James 1 and verse 15 the process that sin follows. How lust conceived within Achan. It brought forth sin, and that brought forth death. Our brother Roger Lewis says that sin comes when weakness meets opportunity. And while we notice that Achan provides a total confession, he doesn't lay blame to anyone else. The process was complete. The command had been broken. And perhaps just one final reference on this, a bookend, if we will, on what we see concerning Achan. Because in James 5, verses 1 to 3, reading from the ESV, James writes, Come now, ye rich, Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded the three things that Achan stole. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. We know, brothers and sisters, that we are to lay up treasure in heaven. Where moth and rust cannot corrupt, we couldn't get a more obvious comparison. We have treasure in heaven, but Achan buried his treasure in the ground as far away as he could get from heaven. Achan, by his actions, brought trouble upon the ecclesia. He caused to spring up, as we're told in Hebrews 12, a root of bitterness. Now, roots, brothers and sisters, come up from the ground. And where did Achan hide these things? In the ground of his tent. But roots grow. Roots grow. That's what happens. Try to hide or bury sin in the very same way that roots grow and spring forth. That's what happens. These roots pop out of the ground. Sooner or later, brothers and sisters, sin comes up. And how easy it can be for us today to try to hide sin in our lives and in our homes. What we do during the week, hidden from view. How many hours, brothers and sisters, are watching things we shouldn't? How often do we find ourselves online into things we know we shouldn't? Hidden from view because we're in the privacy of our own home. But not before God. That's what we're being shown here. And so with Achan's confession, we read Joshua's action in verse 22. And what do we notice here, brothers and sisters, in verse 22? So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. Now what else did we read of messengers being sent to someone's house? Well, of course, that was Rahab, wasn't it? And for Achan, where did they find these items but hidden? In his tent. Rahab too had messengers and she too hid. She hid them under the flax on her roof. But isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters, because both had messengers, both hid something, but with two very different intentions. Achan did this in fear. Rahab did this to join with them in faith. And so they take these items out of his tent And they bring them unto Joshua. And we read in verse 24, Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garments and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. What we see in this verse 
is a principle clearly illustrated to us that what we do, brothers and sisters, inevitably affects others. Think about that. What we do inevitably affects others. The attitude with which we do things, it affects other people. Do we think about this in the context of our life in the truth? Our attitude, brothers and sisters, towards attendance, at lectures, at Bible class, it affects others. If they don't attend, why should I? Our dress and our decorum, the seriousness with which we take that can affect our young ladies in the CYC and in Sunday school. Our desire to do the readings and to do them daily, it affects our children. It affects our ecclesia in the greater sense. Our diligence to strengthen our marriages, to have difficult conversations with our children when necessary. All of these things, brothers and sisters, they're not sins, no. But our actions as individuals affect us as an ecclesia. What a thing to consider this morning in light of what we read. How are we affecting other people? Now, there are a few interesting details that we pick up here in the record of Joshua 7. Did we notice, brothers and sisters, throughout Joshua 7, the way that Achan was described at various places along this story? See, three times we're given his genealogy. Let's just read verse 24 again very carefully. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah. Now, brothers and sisters, just glance back at verse 1. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah. Now look at verse 18. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah. See, what we're being told in verse 24 is that it's just Achan, the son of Zerah. Where did everyone else go? (laughs) Why this change? Why this emphasis? Why are we being taken directly from Achan right to Zerah? And everyone else disappears. Just consider these references, brothers and sisters. We're going to start in Genesis 38. What's the introduction that we have to Zerah? What are we being told here in Joshua 7 with Achan that draws a straight line to Zira and drops the rest of the genealogy? Genesis 38 and reading in verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her, that's Tamar's travail, that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee, therefore his name was called Pharez, and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zerah. Zerah was born with a what? With a scarlet thread around his hand. And what was his brother's name? Pharez. On the screen we have Matthew 1, the genealogy of Christ. And look what we read here in Matthew 1, verse 3. And Judah begat Pharez and Zerah of Tamar. And Pharez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Follow the line of scarlet thread, brothers and sisters. We have Achan from the line of one who had a scarlet thread wrapped around his hand, and yet God would make a switch. The scarlet thread now out of Rahab's house as a result of her incredible faith and obedience. And look at what God is able to do, brothers and sisters. For out of Rahab we trace the line of our Lord Jesus Christ. Achan gave up that hope, that tikvah, 
the line of scarlet thread. That's what we're being shown in Joshua 7. They took Achan, the son of Zerah, who let go of the scarlet thread, that tikvah, that hope. Now, do we notice where else tikvah, this line of hope, of scarlet thread, comes up in the Old Testament? If we were to trace this word in our concordance, we see it used in Hosea 2. Now, just consider the context of Hosea 2. It's speaking here concerning the unfaithfulness of Israel. We have it at the bottom of the screen, Hosea 2, verse 15. It speaks of the unfaithfulness of Israel, but in verse 15, we see a change. We see the mercy of God that, that, that is extended. And listen here, verse 15. I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor, of Achan, for a door of hope. See, the valley of Achan will become a door of tikvah, of hope. That's the line of scarlet thread that was hanging from the window of Rahab's house. See, what a reminder we're being shown, brothers and sisters, in that valley, in the day of Christ's coming. We're being reminded to not ever let go of that scarlet thread, of the hope that we have. Achan, let it go. He took in its place gold, silver, the things of the kingdom of men. And as we walk through that valley before we enter the kingdom of God, we are to always have that reminder with us. There is a door of hope. God can do incredible things with that line of scarlet thread as he's done in the life of Rahab. But we have to remember, don't ever let it go. So let us learn from the example of Achan to let go of what the world would offer to us. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us, brothers and sisters, hold on with everything we have to the line of scarlet thread, to the tikvah, the hope that we have been called to, so that we, with Rahab, might become heirs of the promises to Abraham. Let us overcome Jericho, brothers and sisters, totally and faithfully, just as they did, as we're told in Hebrews 11. Let us leave behind the stuff in our houses. Let us go up, pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that awaits each of us. Let us go through that door of hope, leading us to the kingdom of God.